everyone. So tonight we have one of the really true OGs of the Avalanche ecosystem, Leo. He is the COO of the Pangolin Dex, uh, which is one of the first movers in the Avalanche ecosystem. Uh, you guys also had recently announced from Avalanche Rush incentive program, but at the same time, you're innovating into a Pangolin version 2.0 with a lot of UI re redesigns, tokenomics changes, but also revolutionary stance in terms of the limit orders and permanent loss protection. So with that said, we'll cover all of those topics as much as we can with Leo. Leo, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Hey, Nick, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Excited to talk about Pangolin, Avalanche, DeFi, anything we want to talk about today. Awesome. So for anybody who is listening right now, can you tell us a bit more of your background? How did you even get into the crypto? Because it's still somewhat a very narrow place to be, but the world is slowly getting warmed up to it. What's the origin story? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's always fun talking about origin stories. People get into crypto at different times for different reasons. So I'll kind of talk about what got me interested and then actually what got me building. So, um, you know, like a lot of people, um, I learned about Bitcoin uh, a while ago, back in like 2015, and just the philosophy of money owned by the people, built by the people, controlled by technology, really appealed to me. So I started looking into the technology, investing in Bitcoin, and then Ethereum came out. That kind of blew my mind that you can run smart contracts on blockchains, you can build dApps. That was really awesome. Uh, you know, DeFi summer came last year. I was a DGen. I was playing with all the protocols, farming. <laughs> Uh, but then it got kind of expensive, right? So, so then I found Avalanche, and, and Avalanche, Avalanche was just so refreshing to see um, a new DeFi community, uh, fast transactions, instant finality, cheap fees, and it was a fresh start. There weren't a lot of apps here when I came over, um, so I just wanted to get involved as a builder. I was I was a software developer for ten years, uh, so I started building for a project called Snowball. It's a yield optimizer. Um, worked for them for a couple months. It was great. And then Pangolin needed um, to hire a core team. So uh, the origins of Pangolin was, is a bit unique because it was built by Ava Labs, but uh, their vision was to transition it to the community. And I was the community at the time. So myself, Justin and Brandon uh, were hired to become uh, the core team of Pangolin and we've been running it ever since. And so now uh, I'm working full-time for Pangolin as their COO, partnerships, marketing, operations and it's going really great to see avalanche grow and pangolin grow yeah that's uh, quite a unique journey uh usually people kind of hop and jump between different protocols but it seems like you've stuck within avalanche something i guess pulls you in into the ecosystem what what appealed to you within avalanche why not um, explore other chains or consensus models you know to get your foot in the door uh of building DeFi as an engineer you're just always looking for opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. And you know the other, the other chains were just, I guess, a bit saturated already with um, very mature projects, and they were further along. But but Avalanche seemed like like a brand new sandbox to build in, and it was a really good place for someone in my situation to, to get a head start on something. New. I actually, from our use case here at Protocol, um, we've looked at different blockchains over the their age of maturity. Um, you start with Ethereum, you've experimented with XDAI, you went to uh, Polygon, and now the Avalanche is kind of the more prominent ecosystem with its own um, ecosystem of dApps, but also a brand new consensus model, uh, and also the time to finality, which right now I don't think has been matched within any other protocol. And it's sort of primed for um, a DeFi a true DeFi experience, a more of uh, not only the brand new people who are just joining the ecosystem because the fees are relatively minuscule compared to Ethereum, for example, but also for a more bigger players uh, like institutions who like to execute within a certain time threshold, uh, which again, I think Avalanche provides that with their time to finality. Um, and you guys, you uh, the Pangolin has been around since the original launch of Avalanche, right? It's been um, what is it about nine, nine, ten months? According to what I'm seeing, uh, at least the token has been trading for some time, right? Yeah, you're right about that. So you know, Avalanche came on live maybe fall of 2020, but the but the contract chain, the EVM, um, really wasn't really showcased until Pangolin came out in around February of 2021 this year. Um, you know, Pangolin was built to kind of be 
the main source of liquidity um, for DeFi here to showcase the power of the network. Uh, like you said, the instant finality, the quick fees. Um, there was a cool graphic that Jay from uh, Avalab's Marketing posted this week about how, you know, if you want to do a swap on Uniswap, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's actually cheaper to bridge to Avalanche and do a swap here for the exact same swap, like the, the bridging fee and the gas costs added up together are cheaper than just swapping in, in Ethereum. So, so it's just use cases like that that make it really unique and powerful to build here. And, um, you know, another topic that comes up is, is the forks and existing projects coming. Like, well, Aave is already on Ethereum. What's the difference between Aave over there and Aave over here? And why I think it's different is, is just coming back to the technology of the network is when you have much cheaper fees and quicker transactions, it just opens up the creativity of what you can implement both on the builder side and on kind of the user mm -hmm. behavior actually changes and they're willing to try more things than on a more expensive network. Yeah, for anybody who's listening, we're recording this on October 6th and it's been already a couple of days since Aave and Curve ported over the protocol into the Avalanche ecosystem. And from what I've seen so far at uh, the bridge transactions, there's been a quite a large inflow um, and velocity of money uh, transfer between Ethereum and Avalanche. How do you think the incentive systems, for example, Avalanche Rush or the one that Polygon had about half a year ago, influence this kind of the frequency and velocity of money? Is it just temporary? Do you think the, the funds essentially will be transferred over just to acquire some sort of yield and additional alpha while the incentives last? Or is it more of a, a sticky situation with Avalanche Rush? We've talked to Luigi last week, and their plan has a lot of great benefits for everybody who stays within the ecosystem. But I want to hear somebody who actually builds within the ecosystem. What do you guys think? And to reiterate the question, it's kind of, you know, is, is this capital moving around between chains? Um, you know, is it mercenary? Does it just follow the highest yields and incentives? Mm -hmm. Or does it actually have, you know, personality and does it stick around to things it likes? And, um, we, we, we see a little bit of both. You know, when you build a strong culture and community on a chain, uh, people just want to keep using it and building it and watching it thrive. And we've seen that in, um, you know, the Ethereum ecosystem. I think Polygon has a great ecosystem too. It's people who love what's being built regardless of, you know, if APRs are a little higher. Some and I think that's what Pangolin and Avalanche are striving to do is to build this culture of innovative apps, um, a fun place to use DeFi and invest. And that's what's going to get people to stick around. But kind of like you mentioned, um, there is capital that's just purely mercenary. It's there to make a profit. And if APRs are 10% higher on another network, it's going to move over to chase that yield. And there's not, uh, I think, too much we can do for that class of capital. So we kind of have to target you know, the capital that actually stick around. I think there's definitely, there's like categorization that needs to happen for the capital that everybody's trying to essentially fight for. Because at this moment in time, like there's not a lot of inflow of capital from the traditional finance for everybody not to fight it for the exactly the same pie, which is kind of everybody's trying to explore how to get some piece of that Ethereum total liquidity that's been locked there. But I think Avalanche has a lot of different incentives and upside in terms of making that liquidity stick. And well, one of those benefits or incentives within the ecosystem, I think is Pangolin indexed. Um, so tell us the story of Pangolin, what has been done so far and what are you guys trying to achieve in the future? So, you know, what, what Pangolin's vision is and what we're trying to build here is a, is a premier community-driven DEX, right? So, so as an, a DEX, as an automated market maker, uh, we want to be able to support the traders, the liquidity providers, and the projects that, that rely on the infrastructure that a DEX can have to provide, you know, the best swaps, lowest slippage, um, and the liquidity needed to support all the projects in the ecosystem. And the community as driven aspect really, really falls into that where, you know, uh, we're not centralized in our decision making, we may we vote on things, we're very close with all the projects building here and the new projects coming in to provide a lot of support. And so we kind of see ourselves as that foundational hub of DeFi almost on Avalanche. And that's a role that we've been playing since our inception. And that's a role that we want to keep playing too. But let's talk about innovation. So, you know, we can't stay competitive as a DEX if we don't change and evolve and innovate. Uh, in some ways, so we're trying to do that 
are, uh, so first of all, like UX, we're always pushing the limits of UX so that it's easier for users to use DeFi. Right? Uh, as you're, I'm sure you've noticed, but DeFi UX is, is pretty tricky, just like MetaMask wallets <laughs> and, and, and apps. And it's kind of an afterthought to most builders because they're more focused on the contract. Um, and that's scary to new people. They don't, they want to get involved, but, but they might be scared away if the UX isn't right. Uh, the second place we want to improve is definitely tokenomics and uh, you know as a dex that's dependent on aprs to drive tvl um, we want to get that right we want to get the tokenomics right we want to get emissions in the right places to incentivize the right types of liquidity and then the last place i want to call out that we're trying to innovate is um, just onboarding liquidity and users uh, like you said right now uh, liquidity is kind of just being moved around between chains the hard part is how do we get new liquidity into the system, institutions from new retail users. And um, Penguin's looking at two things right now. So one, we've already got a fiat on ramp where you can just use your credit card to buy some Avox and start playing in the ecosystem. I think we're the first app with that. So that's been really helpful to users trying to just get liquidity into the network. And uh, the second part is partnering with these of regulatory KYC projects, because we, we know that regulation's coming in some form or fashion, and we just wanna be prepared in terms of if we need to KYC in certain countries or restrict certain functionality, well, we wanna be ready for it. We don't wanna be blindsided by it. And I just wanna also call out that uh, as a whole, Avalanche and Ava Labs have done a great job building the Avalanche a bridge between Avalanche and Ethereum. It's probably the best bridge on the market right now in terms of cost, speed, and safety, and the technology that you just is just cutting it. Also, oh, UX. Totally, totally. Yeah. You, the UX is superb. You just feel so comfortable. You know, I've, I've used exactly. like, like ten different bridges to various networks, and some are just. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> It's like throwing your money into a black hole and hoping it gets spit out on the other side. You know? Yeah, exactly. I think the UX uh, plays a big role for a brand new capital or especially young capital within a DeFi ecosystem. Uh, somebody who is very accustomed to a slick UX from Robinhood and this kind of brand style promise that, okay, we, we have executed your trade. And once they dive into the DeFi and you have this MetaMask that kind of still looks like it's 1999, and then you jump in the first iteration of Uniswap and you just you just do a swap and then you just have to wait 10 minutes for the trade to execute. But what happens in those first 10 minutes for a brand new user, their heart starts pumping <laughs> out of their chest and they start questioning every single decision that they've made so far. But I completely agree regarding the uh, the bridge. It's very efficient. It tells literally validator by validator where your transaction is and where the transfer is in the moment. And uh, I think Avascan has a lot of really cool updates um, on the way with pending transactions, which will kind of ease the questionability of where's my transaction, even though you still have this transaction finality under one second. Um, it's humanly probably impossible to submit a transaction and then go to Avascan to see if it's pending or not. <laughs> but yeah, I completely agree. It's very user-friendly. And I think it's also very important for D apps to innovate on the UX front. And I think that's what you guys are trying to do with your UX upgrade. I've seen some screenshots over the Twitter, but I think you would be the best person to explain what you guys are trying to achieve with the UX upgrade. I'd love to dig into our UX vision. Um, you know, we have a great UX designer, uh, Abdullah, who's been doing the mockups for us and then our front end team's been executing on it. Uh, but basically the vision is we, we wanted to just look and feel like a, like a sex, like you're using Binance with all the functionality there, you know, your limit orders, your leverage, um, your, your charting. And we want the experience um, to just be very, very seamless so that new users and existing users uh, feel like they're using something that's very comfortable, if that makes sense. And we think that'll drive, you know, adoption, usage, volume, if we can get that UX right. I 100% agree. Um, I'm looking actually at the UX right now. There's a couple of new icons that are really interesting on the left-hand side bar uh, from the some of the leaked images that's in the web. Uh, there's a swap tab, which is essentially two arrows. Um, and then there's an additional two, which I think it's staking and farms. So you guys will also redesigning not, also, not only kind of the execution part of the swap, but also the staking, the pools, the farming, pretty much like the whole brand new deal. Definitely. Um, yeah, our current UI is, is very much uh, just kind of like a Uniswap flavored fork UI, which people like and are familiar with. 
but you know that that concept is is uh, outdated now because people want better and so uh, yeah every functionality in our app from swapping to farming uh, to new functionality like zapping we want all of that to be very streamlined that's great um question are you guys allow the users to create their own custom charts with lines or um, any sort of financial or data-driven indicators by having a, a wallet signature to save those kind of presets or yep. in the in the first version you guys are going to have just a basic basic grabs and then you'll innovate on top of that uh, yeah that's a good question um so the first question was kind of like wallet presets and we, we do want to do some profiling um i'm gonna have to check if that is going to save like chart preferences or not mm -hmm. but as for the specifics of the chart itself we're using the kind of pro version the advanced version of trading view charts right now uh, which a lot of people do like and it's actually hard to come by in dApps because of like the whole licensing ordeal a new dApp can't just say i want it and get next day they have to kind of go to contract and they'll with trade which is why it was harder to get but we have it now and it's been very popular that's great i actually didn't know that you need to have uh some sort of a licensing agreement for using kind of like a third party charting software. But that's great. Um, again, any kind of UX upgrade, I think is going to be very beneficial for the protocol. Um, the adoption is just kind of uh, the ease of use uh, for a brand new user. I think that's great. I wanted to touch upon something more behind the curtain topics like tokenomics. So what's the current tokenomic structure of Pangolin? Right now, from what I'm seeing, is there's a lot of rewards and incentive-based um, staking or farming through a certain uh, liquidity provision for certain pairs and also voting within your governance system. I think that's very important. But tell us the current tokenomics and what are you guys trying to achieve with, I guess, version 2.0 of PNG? You know, tokenomics is a science in and of itself. And and people kind of underestimate how much it drives the success of a project, just having good tokenomics. Mm -hmm. So uh, first I'll cover the utility of the token itself, like why PNG is it used for. And then we can talk a little bit about the emission schedule. So, mm -hmm. so uh, PNG Pangolin was formed as a community driven project, meaning decisions are made by governance. So we vote on chain, our community does. And the voting power comes from the PNG token. Um, so that in itself has inherent value. Uh, you get to influence the direction, uh, you know, like a multi-million dollar platform, which is powerful. Um, so that's the start of the PNG token. But uh, you know, additional utility is always good too. So the PNG token can be staked for some pretty good APR right now. Stake the PNG token earn AVOX at around 75% APR. So that's that just came last month. It's been very popular. 23% of PNG tokens are, are locked up in that staking right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, uh, what is it, about 13 million plus of PNG um, currently locked in for those contracts for staking? Yeah, yeah. And by locked, I mean just deposited. We, you know, mm -hmm. we don't have a time lock on it. You can withdraw any time. Um, but what's really exciting in my mind about the utility part is getting PNG used in other platforms for various reasons. Uh, the main one I'm excited about is lending and borrowing, right? Um, so platforms like like Banky is one of the biggest lending borrowing platform, Avalanche, and we want PNG to be able to use that as collateral. So you can deposit your tokens and borrow another token. And the requirement for that is to have a chain link price feed so that these platforms can get safe price readings. And to qualify for a chain link price feed, you need two major DEXs and like two to three plus uh, centralized exchanges. So that's what we're pushing for right now is let's get listed in enough places that chain link will build this feed to support us. And that's going to open up a lot of doors. That's very interesting. So basically, kind of the whole premise behind Chainlink is we need to have as much wider coverage for the market, right? For a single asset, like for example, PNG. And that's probably the reason why they require um, kind of the centralized uh, exchanges placements and all of those different requirements that you mentioned in order to get the wide array of breadth for a specific market for this a specific token, right? like a specific crypto asset. Is that is that kind of the philosophy that they're going for it, uh, so that um, a token will be able to qualify for their price? Exactly, exactly. It's all about um, you know safety and accuracy of, of price, right? Mm -hmm. And before I dig into that, I just want to call out that the Chainlink team is A+. They are so professional, everyone we've interacted with. 
Uh, I've met a couple of them in person at, at a conference and, and they are just very excellent, that whole project. But uh, specifically about oracles and why they want so many price feeds is just anti-price manipulation, right? Um, mm -hmm. Since these smart contracts are you know, permissionless, they just do what is what they're told to do. If you can manipulate the price reading of a smart contract to something malicious, then that's how a lot of exploits happen. And even with really big tokens like Dai, I think got manipulated once on Coinbase because that was the only price feed. That's why they want to see so many different price feeds now so that not one single point of failure they can kind of average places. Does that kind of make sense? We actually had a conversation with uh, Chainlink God about half a year ago regarding decentralized oracles and the aggregation of price feeds and the layers of aggregation that Chainlink goes to in order to validate a market accurate price, what's actually true in time between all the different uh, centralized and decentralized exchanges. And it's really kind of refreshing to see that big and successful protocols such as Pangolin chasing this kind of stamp from a middleware provider like Chainlink. It kind of gives uh, the whole ecosystem a bit more truth stamp, a more, a more decentralized truth network where they're trying to essentially validate that whatever the price is being traded at among multiple different exchanges is actually true, which again, allows for a certain liquidity or lending and borrowing protocol qualifications. That's that's very interesting. So are you guys going to be rolling out a lending, a borrowing protocol or function within Pangolin, or are you trying to qualify for PNG to be to have an ability to lend and borrow on protocols such as Aave, Bank or Curve? Yeah, we're gonna lean on uh, partner projects for now to leverage their platforms instead of building our own. Having your own lending borrowing platform is a beast in itself. Not only from the development and maintenance, but the you know incentivizing liquidity. Now you need a, a whole new set of liquidity incentives. So yeah, definitely Banky first. Banky is a very strong project, uh, mm -hmm. partner project of ours that we want to get the PNG token added to. And, and Banky is also one of the native projects on Avalanche, right? I haven't seen them being deployed anywhere else except Avalanche. Yeah, Banky is a really great su success story because um, they're one of the biggest native Avalanche projects. They were created by the Rome blockchain team, who has a, a couple of products un under their umbrella. They build Banky, they build Velox for limit orders. They built the Rome terminal, which is a trading charting aggregator. Um, but Banky was really the catalyst that started the avalanche rush uh, because the incentives program was announced and then Banky was like Banky grew to like 2 billion TVL, I think, in the first couple of weeks, which is just insanely impressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we, we're just continually looking for integrations with different partners. That's great. Are you guys also working on some of the deflationary measures um, or what I have in front of me, I'm reading the tokenomics improvement proposal that includes burns? Is that some sort of a burn mechanism, like for example, EAP 1559, that quite a lot of people are familiar with on Ethereum, where a certain portion of a transaction fee is being burned and kind of reduce the circulation? Or is it something else? So the second half of the tokenomics topic is, is emissions, right? Um, so the, the good thing I like about Pangolin's original tokenomics is the fair launch model, where 95% goes to farmers, and only and five percent goes to airdrops and a little bit to like a community treasury uh, and that's it and so you don't you're not left wondering well what about these private tokens over here and these investor tokens over here when do they unlock it you know that's not really a worry to investors right now um, but as for the emissions uh, the original model was to have it having every four years for around 28 years kind of like Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. And for, for some token projects that works, um, for a DEX that's reliant on emission to incentivize liquidity, it didn't make as much sense to us when we revisited uh, the emission schedule. And so uh, the first thing we want to do is to kind of shorten that schedule and, and curb it down uh, each month instead of waiting for like a four-year halving. Um, so that does reduce supply each month. And so if demand stays constant, supply goes down, you know, the economic principle is that the value of something can go up. And as for the burns specifically, um, it's going to be uh, kind of like a buyback and burn through swap fee revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, so most DEXs uh, get, generate revenue through swap fees. Most goes back to LP providers, but some is routed towards the DEX itself. 
Uh, right now we're using that to fund market makers for our listings. And once that is sufficiently funded, we're gonna take those revenues to buy back PNG tokens periodically. I think we're planning on every two weeks and, and burning them to take them out of circulation. And that's a pretty powerful uh, deflationary measure um, from like an actual practical economic and math perspective. I think we're pulling in something like 25 to 50K in revenue per day. And so if you add that up over two weeks, that's a lot of buyback and burn power. And then from yeah. a psychological perspective, just as an investor, if you know that something is being taken out of supply on a constant basis, like you just feel a little more comfortable that this isn't just going to get inflated away. Yeah, but you also guys are tackling this problem from both sides, right? Because you're curving the supply and at the same time, you're going to be in the near term or whenever the listings are confirmed, will be also having uh, an inflatory buying pressure for the asset because from what I understand, for a certain portion from the fees that you're going to be generating that should be going towards the DEX going to be used to buy back the PNG. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. And you know, we've thought, we've thought long and hard about this problem and this seemed like the most optimal way to improve uh, the tokenomics. Yeah, so it seems like you're basically rewarding the token holders for the adoption and the use cases of the protocol. So the more that you use the protocol, the more buy pressure from the protocol itself is being influenced towards the token price. And at the same time, you're rewarded with all the benefits such as staking with uh, Avalanche Rush uh, incentives that's going to be built out for PNG, but also for uh, the governance voting. Um, I think it's a very, uh, very unique case. Um, we've talked to Bankor team and Nate Hinman from Bankor team. He kind of laid out a very good argument towards a longer term decentralization and or giving power back to the people and to the users through the formation of Dell. Do you guys have the same kind of ideology or plan to slowly kind of exclude yourself um, from the major decision making and let the community drive it? Or is it kind of already happening within the governance model? That's a good question. Um, Penguin's in a unique situation with the whole spectrum of centralization to decentralization. Uh, most DeFi projects start centralized because uh, as a smaller project, it's necessary to move quickly um, and to pivot to f if, until you find what's successful. Um, so most projects start centralized to a team making decisions. They grow to a certain size and they're like, okay, we've had enough success that now let's turn things over to the community more. Pangolin was actually more of the opposite, where Pangolin almost launched a fully decentralized, where um, almost everything was voted on through governance. Even like adding a new farm for a new token, that was voted on through governance. And we've actually realized that's not really optimal right now. We've had to kind of kind of centralize some of those decisions a little more so we can move faster and pivot um, to stay competitive and relevant in this space. But you know, I think you're right that we, we just kind of need to recognize what makes more sense to give the team autonomy to do, you know, things like hiring, things like adding farms, and what makes sense to have the community vote on, you know, spending community treasury funds, for example. And we're in such early days of DAOs forming. Everyone's still trying to figure out what's optimum. But I think we're, we're slowly getting there and we're moving to a DAO-driven world, a governance-driven world, which is great to see. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think DAO formations, at least in our view here at Protocol, we kind of view the whole ecosystem evolving slowly into um, uh, kind of a, a DApp level DAOs, then certain segment uh, or portion of DeFi uh, kind of micro DAOs. And then we're looking at the overall ecosystem like macro DAOs with governing power over um, a subset of DApps or a subset of uh, uh, different protocols. It's kind of interesting to see how this whole space evolves. I don't think this will happen overnight. Um, and I think you're right in terms of uh, the initial rollout of the protocol, where you have this explosive growth uh, that needs to be driven within a specific narrative. And that specific narrative cannot be driven by a DAO uh, because you just have a lot of different users, uh, with their own kind of incentives uh, to play out. But in order to develop this kind of brand identity that sticks the capital and sticks the user base, um, I think you need that original brand new vision and to some at fault <laughs> to say on a decentralized 
podcast a more centralized kind of vision at first. Um, and then I guess uh, people can exclude themselves from the process, um, which kind of drives us back into the circle, um, into um, your innovation within Pangolin. What you guys are building, I think, is the very first technology on Avalanche in terms of the limit orders and impermanent loss protection. Let's talk about that. That's a very exciting topic. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, limit orders um, are not foreign to, to traders, right? You know, traders for, for stocks and on centralized exchanges for tokens, they're used to putting limit orders, but uh, on a decentralized exchange, it's a little bit more unique due to the technical limitations. Of it's not easy to save state. It's not easy to save these users' orders um, in a scalable fashion. So that's been a tough problem for projects to solve. Uh, but it's also necessary because people uh, do want to make smart financial decisions and limit orders definitely facilitate smart trades. Uh, so we're partnering with uh, a project called Autonomy Network that helps DEXs like ours natively integrate these limit orders uh, and this impermanent loss protection, which I'll touch on next. Um, so limit orders are pretty straightforward to understand. You say, you say what price you want to buy or sell something at. It saves it somewhere, and then when the price is hit, it executes. As for the impermanent loss protection, um, this has been something that DeFi has been trying trying to solve ever since farming started, right? And impermanent loss was a thing where, uh, in some situations, if you pair two tokens in a dex, you're gonna actually be losing out on gains. Um, where, where if you just never paired those tokens, uh, you would have been in a better spot. And so the original project I can think of that tried to solve this is Bancor, where they where they have users stake the BNT token to kind of facilitate um, and, and mitigate IL losses. The way that we're approaching it in Pangolin for IL protection is more of a, of a stop loss concept where you set a threshold of IL that you're comfortable taking on. And if it ever dips below that threshold, it'll automatically exit you from the farm to prevent any further IL. And that's powerful because um, you know, if you're not closely monitoring your positions, um, they can get to a place where you're not comfortable anymore. Uh, and also this, this allows people to be more comfortable with providing liquidity with farming in Pangolin. That's a very interesting narrative. So basically you're putting a stop loss on the impermanent loss for a double-sided liquidity provider. Exactly, exactly. Interesting. So um, explain it to somebody um, in your words, uh, what is impermanent loss for somebody who is just diving in DeFi? What is impermanent loss and how do you think it, uh, it is a very important topic not to neglect when providing liquidity? Yeah, definitely. And permanent loss, um, you know, it's, it's a very important concept to understand as a DeFi user, as a farmer. Um, so as a new user, you come in and you see these high APRs, 100%, 200% APR indexes um, for providing liquidity. And by providing liquidity in the automated market maker model, we mean you take two tokens and you pair them up and then people can trade between those two tokens. Uh, let's take Avox and PNG, for example. Um, and so you're providing a service for traders and you get rewarded in swap fees, you get rewarded in token rewards, but you're also taking on risk. And this risk is impermanent loss because the way the AMM model works is uh, when the prices of these two tokens fluctuate in different directions from each other, um, you get more of one of the token and less of the other token at a given point in time. So there's certain scenarios where one of the tokens you paired went up or down so much relative to the other token that the financial situation you're in offsets any gains you would have had through the farming. And that's where the impermanent loss concept comes in. It's kind of actually a scary term uh, because you're not always losing money. It just means you could have gained more money if you just never farmed at all, if that makes sense. Um, and so... People try to solve this in, in two ways, I think. One is you offer enough incentives, a, a high enough APR that it offsets the impermanent. And the other way is to solve it through technology, um, like we were talking about the IL protection that, that exits you right when your risk threshold is met. Or in Bancor's case, um, there's some reserve tokens that will protect you that were in the system. There's a lot of different protocols that try to solve it in different ways. Um, I think Uniswap V3 has a range 
that the liquidity provision is going to be enabled so that the liquidity providers can so, some sort of limit their exposure to impairment loss, but it's still present. Um, what you guys are trying to do is essentially, it's like a stop loss for your impermanent loss protection. So in the event when you provide two tokens, right, and think of it as a, uh, as a spread, Let's say it's two to one, right? The one token has cost $2, another one costs $1. And whenever that peg or spread two to one starts to deviate, that deviation is what's known in the industry as a permanent loss. And the more that the two tokens deviate one from another, you essentially have this rebalancing that happens on the AMM side where they have to balance it back to the peg, which is sometimes it's 60-40, sometimes it's 50-50, depending on the, um, on the tokens. But when that rebalancing happens, basically you're sacrificing your own tokens in exchange to still have the position for providing the liquidity. That's a very interesting concept that you're going to provide this kind of a stop loss solution. Will there be some sort of historical impermanent loss kind of data for the users to kind of examine and say, okay, over the last 30 days or 60 days or 90 days or a certain period of time, the impermanent loss range was about 3%. Um, and then the users can make a more qualifying and quantifying decision to say, okay, we want to make our stop loss beyond, let's say, 3%, because the average for the last 90 days is 3%. Are you guys going to be doing that? Or uh, the first rollout is going to be more of uh, an infancy phase where the user will be saying, okay, we'll have to do our own homework through like a third party applications to measure the permanent loss on the historic time scale, and then kind of come into the pangolin and say, we're going to put it at a certain certain range. I think for the first phase, it's just the, the stop loss tool itself. But you're right that we do want to show a lot more data in analytics because it's all on chain. It's all it's all there mm -hmm. if, if you can dig it out and present it in a, in a way that you just can understand it. And that's what we want to provide in the next version of our UX as well is, is just more data so that users can make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. It is uh, whenever the, I guess, impermanent loss, stop loss, uh, is going to happen, is it going to be charged through a user? Like, for example, they would have to pay um, AVX for a transaction, or is it going to be baked in within the, I guess, fee structure or payout? What's what's your kind of structure of the transaction fees for, for this kind of action? I want to say when they when they set the order, they're they're paying a fee already, but I'm mm -hmm. going to have to circle back on the specifics of that with you. So it's probably going to be like exactly the same functionality as limit orders, right? Because with limit orders, you'll also will have to pay AVAX fees, right? Because it's going to be an avalanche. Right. Yeah. It's it's going to be an on-chain transaction. So someone is going to have to pay a gas fee at some point. Someone has to always pay the fee. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I got to pay the uh, got to pay the node providers for upkeeping the network. Yeah, to making it safe. That's a yeah. That's something a lot of people neglect when they complain about the high fees. Um, essentially, you're just making the node providers and rewarding them for making the network secure and decentralized. And I guess that's a lot of people forget about this kind of main principle that got a lot of current users or even brand new users into the ecosystem. But so look, we've talked about impermanent loss, very exciting stuff. I'm looking forward to testing this one out. Limit orders. So with limit orders, is this going to be rolled out across all the pairs or just the major pairs as a kind of initial rollout? Yeah, we'd like to support you know all the pairs on this, or at least the ones that we we think are safe, right? Um, so all the major tokens, and mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be integrated right within the UI, very intuitive to use. You know, we do have uh, Velox today for limit orders, but you, but you have to kind of navigate into their app, and the UX is a little different, so that kind of deters some people from trying that. But if we can make it look and feel like something users are used to, uh, and provide enough support for the major tokens that they like trading, we think it's going to drive a lot of usage and volume into Pangolin. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of, um, I guess, users' requests because as more capital moves in, as as more users become sophisticated within the ecosystem and because the markets are 24-7, there's no turn off button and let's go grab a coffee, uh, like in traditional finance. But if somebody misses a trade while they were asleep, I think limit orders will be a great benefit, especially on Avalanche, right? Like you have a transaction finality, so you'll have a guaranteed execution with a Snowman++ that ironed out. 
some minor bugs within the execution. But overall, I think having limit orders within Avalanche ecosystem, even of itself, is a big plus for the ecosystem. I think that you guys will have a lot of growth from just this functionality alone. But I'm really excited to actually see you guys in the video beyond that because, again, Pangolin, super cool decks. It was actually the the very first decks on Avalanche that we've made our transactions and swaps, and we felt comfortable doing so. Um, and I hope everybody else would agree who is listening to the podcast. And I would encourage you guys to go check it out. We actually noticed that majority of the times, Pangolin gives us better spread execution for the trades and lower slippage than some other DEXs within the eco space. Is that because you guys have a more tightened slippage on the AMM side or um, there's a lot more liquidity for certain pairs that you have in order to achieve those kind of better executions rather than some of the other DApps? You know, we're always looking at our liquidity and, and getting trying to get liquidity in the right places for swaps, right? So, you know, if you look at the tokens by volume, uh, stable coins and ETH are probably the highest volume pairs that get traded, but uh, you don't always come to Avalanche to trade stable coins and ETH. You want to get into where the alpha is, the native tokens and mm -hmm. things like that. So we do uh, make sure that we have sufficient liquidity and we're integrated with our partners for that type of liquidity. Uh, I think some popular tokens like Chi, like Zava from Avalon, like Yak from Yield Yak, those tokens, we want to make sure we have uh, enough liquidity in the right places. So that, like you said, you're, you're getting the best possible prices and lowest slippage on your swap. That's awesome. Um, given that you guys are innovating within the space, what's your opinion on the current ecosystem? What do you think the Avalanche ecosystem is growing into? I think everybody's had their expectations blown out of the water once Av uh, um, Aave and uh, Curve ported over their protocols into Avalanche. And we've seen in about under a day, at 2 billion total value locked on Aave. And I don't want to miss uh, communicate the actual value that was transferred additionally over the bridge, but everybody can go at it and check it themselves. It's, it's quite a substantial value. What are you guys looking forward to within the ecosystem? Um, are you guys partnering with other dApps? Is there any exciting things that happening within your world? Let's talk about some future plans beyond the version of 2.0 of Pangolier and kind of overall ecosystem and the network. Um, we are so excited about this space. So let me first touch upon just the C chain, and then let me touch upon beyond the C chain. Um, so the C chain is the you know the DeFi layer where all the DApps live, uh, and we're excited about the blue chips that are coming, the Aves, the Curves, because we think that they're going to be innovating here in ways that they can't like Ethereum, just because of the transaction times and the costs. There's some cool ideas that you can do, but you don't do them because it's too expensive. Users won't, won't, do what, won't use what you built because it's too expensive in certain places. But on Avalanche, you can, you can do some really great things that you can do before because of the instant finality and the low costs. So uh, excited to see just existing projects make their apps even better. Uh, I'm excited to see some uh, new financial products that aren't here yet. Uh, for example, like Perpetual Futures are coming with, with Hubble. And just so many builders are coming to Avalanche because it's an exciting new place because they're getting the support they need, incentives in terms of community and users. So that's all very exciting to see. Uh, I think we're, we've been announcing like one partnership a day almost for the past month yeah. because <laughs> yeah, so many projects are coming and they just need that little boost, like a farm and some marketing to get started. Uh, and Pangolin's here as the, as the DeFi hub to support all of that. Um, so every week our announcement schedule is just jam-packed with partnerships and integration with farms. And that's what makes me really excited is we're able to facilitate all this growth and be a part of that. Yeah, that's exactly uh, the reason why I wanted to ask this question. You guys have been literally on a daily basis uh, announcing partnerships and brand new uh, pairs for liquidity providers of farms. Um, it's, it's quite exciting to see that the ecosystem um, and kind of DeFi partnership uh, is blossoming. For sure, for sure. You know, we, we love all of the partners that we've been talking to. It's, it's so great. For example, I, I just got off a call with Ample Firth yesterday, and they, they want to come build here. And, um, you know, just last summer, I was, I was a DeFi DJ and aping into Ample Firth, and now I'm talking <laughs> to the team, coordinating partnerships. It's it's pretty wild to see that. Um, but, you know, like this uh, this whole kind of idea of uh, if we build, they'll come. Um, it's half true because if we build, some of them will come, but if we'll give them incentives 
everybody will come. And now everybody is looking at the ecosystem and what you can do with the C chain, right? Subnets on Avalanche and especially kind of the OGD apps and how they're evolving within the ecosystem. Now everybody wants to be a part of it. Oh yeah, the the Ava Labs team built such a professional and great network. Uh, it's such a smooth experience to transact on the C chain. It's fantastic. Um, but what gets, I think, the OGs of Avalanche even more excited is thinking beyond the C chain into subnets, mm -hmm. where uh, the C chain is just one VM that users can use and builders can build on. But the concept of subnets is just infinite virtual machines with different rules than the EVM has. Um, and this is where you can get very creative in terms of what you want to build in this space. For example, um, you know, permissions in terms of KYC, you can permission different subnets based on country. In terms of institutions, they can run their entire blockchain networks on an Avalanche subnet. So that kind of gets a new class of user and investor into Avalanche. And I think a lot of people will say the C chain, it's already very impressive, 5 billion in TVL and thousands of users. But that's just the tip of the iceberg of the vision of you know Avalanche and the Ava Labs team. And that's what gets me excited. And Penguin wants to also get into that space of building beyond the C chain. Are you guys going to be building a subnet? Is that what you're saying? Well, it's it's in the plans, right? Um, I, I think the network doesn't fully support like going live in subnets yet, but uh, ever since the team has come into Avalanche, even before Pangolin, that's always been the dream to kind of build into the subnet space. Um, so we're, we've been brainstorming and we're, we're kind of trying to position people and resources in a way that we can hit the ground running once that's ready. Yeah, that's, the, the whole subnet um, topic is very fascinating. It seems like that kind of uh, development alone can exponentially drive the adoption within the Avalanche ecosystem. Um, like you mentioned, there could be different institutions running their whole infrastructures in the blockchain on the subnet. There could be games, completely separate metaverses or universes created on subnets. Um, there could be uh, liquidity providers or aggregators running on completely different subnets, right? It's it's very, very interesting phenomenon, I, I would say, because that's not present in any other blockchain, is it? Um, yeah, you know, other blockchains try to provide the same functionality. Um, I think like Polkadot has something similar, although it's yeah. a little more limited than, than what Avalanche allows the other chains. So I think when builders look around to see where they should build, they, they see Avalanche, they read about the subnets, and they get very excited. Yeah, I agree. Um, and Pol Polkadot has uh, power chains. I don't think they're alive yet. Um, I could be wrong, though. But at the same time, the subnets are not fully alive on Avalanche. It's interesting going to be who is going to be the first to have the market ready product and then to see the adoption curve. Because I think on Polkadot side, that's the main driven narrative um, of the whole ecosystem is the power chains. Very exciting stuff. One thing that I want to ask you is you guys have a DEX, Pangolin, right? Um, which allows the liquidity provision for certain pairs to. Uh, acquire some rewards uh, for liquidity providers. You have staking, you have governance for your token, you have a swap, uh, which is the main uh, revenue driver for DEX and functionality for its users. Are you guys thinking of building an NFT swap, like um, something alongside that currently Yeti swap has, but it's a very, very infant stage from what we've seen. Are you guys interested into in diving into that marketplace or you're currently mainly trying to drive the innovation within the AMM and DEX. Yeah, so you're asking about like a marketplace where people can buy, uh, create, and swap their NFTs, right? Yeah, like a more of a decentralized version of OpenSea. Um, you know, it's crossed our minds, and we think that it's better to concentrate our resources and, and dev hours into making the DEX side of our product better. Although we do want to scale horizontally with different product lines, the whole you know, NFT marketplace is a really tough infrastructure piece to build, which is why you haven't seen too many launch yet. Um, but, but we're trying to add some pretty strong marketplace partners. Um, for example, Kalau just launched, mm -hmm. uh, and they have the kind of virtualization where you can use VR to look at NFTs. And that's all very cool. But we think they're going to be a strong player, and we just like to kind of leverage partners that are already specialized in building marketplaces uh, instead of trying to build our own from scratch, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. 
And just a, a little bit of a teaser for anyone, any Pangolin fans listening, we, <laughs> we do have our own NFT collection in the works. Can't say too much about it yet, but we're pretty excited to have some Pangolin themed NFTs soon. That's actually what's going to be my follow-up question. Because my leading question was about the functionality of having the NFT marketplace. And my other question would, would have been, um, are you guys working on something? That's very exciting. Are we, are we looking into some on-chain kind of generation of pangolins? Or is it something that will be more of a surprise that you, when you guys are going to announce it? Um, yeah, this, this series that I have in mind is one of the kind of uh, algorithmically generated uh, series with unique traits. So you, you mint one, but you don't really know what you're going to get. It's mm -hmm. kind of fun in that way. And I mean, the purpose of this is to just generate community involvement, uh, build a culture of excitement uh, to get users to feel like they're really part of the ecosystem. Right now. I know I always love getting NFTs and feeling like, like I'm a part of something and figuring <laughs> out, like, is this a rare one? And like hunting for rare ones. It's always really fun. And, I, and we kind of just want that experience for the Penguin community as well. That's awesome. That's actually very, very exciting. With that said, um, I think we are coming into one hour of our conversation. I want to give off the stage to you. Tell us where people can find more about you, more about the Pangolin Dex, or any other resources that you think would be beneficial for anybody who is listening right now. The floor is yours. Take it away. Sure. Thanks, Nick. So just a final note to anyone listening. You know, thanks for listening in, uh, learning about DeFi, learning about Avalanche and Pangolin. If you want to learn more about our projects, swing by Twitter, Discord, Telegram. We're there all day, every day, engaging the community. Wow. Our website is pangolin.exchange. And uh, the final note is just if you haven't been on Avalanche yet, uh, just bridge some assets across and play around. The bridge is super cheap. I think it costs like 6 or $7 each year. And it's a beautiful place to use DeFi. So just give it a try. And thanks for hosting me, Nick. I had a blast. Awesome. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. For anybody who's listening, go check out Pangolin Dex. It's on Avalanche. And if you haven't bridged your NGMI, just saying it out loud but thank you leo for joining us today uh for more of our content you can visit protocol 432.com where we have our all of our podcasts and notes and images and links to everything that we've talked about but until then we'll talk to you guys in the next one awesome thank you Thank you everyone who just joined for another great episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and consider subscribing on your platform of choice. But until then, we'll see you guys in the next one.